So, if there's one person in the world you could ask about book marketing, who would it be? Well, we chose. Uh, well, a former military specialist. Who is dyslexia? And uh, who's a Red Sox fan? <laughs> and who <laughs> speaks <laughs> Mandarin Chinese fluently? But and who also, also <laughs> but who also made two hundred twenty-four thousand no, dollars? No, it was four hundred twenty-four thousand dollars in self-publishing. And who has found it, Kindlepreneur? And if you still not know who it is, then just it's the Kindlepreneur himself, the mastermind himself <laughs> behind the self-publishing. No, I what? actually what? just wanted to tell who we are and then tell the people afterwards <laughs> because. <laughs> When they when they hear his name, then they'll be like, oh, who are these seagulls again? No. We are Andrea and Freya. And we're here to become international best-selling authors. And we're here to take you along for the ride. Yes, and that ride includes other people. And today it was Dave. Jason. Yeah. And I, hope and I, really, I really hope I pronounced the name correctly. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, I'm gonna let you do it. Um, so, so we have just had an amazing interview. We have learned so much, and the best yes. thing about it is we are gonna let you in on everything he told us, which was amazing. So mm -hmm. he has been spilling secrets, and make sure you get them all. Yes. So without further ado, just take pen and paper, and now we can talk. <laughs> See you. See you after the interview. Hi, Dave. Thanks for being here. Thanks Absolutely. for taking the time. So we just wanted to run something by you and we're sure you will agree. So we kind of mastered the German market by nice. using Publisher Rocket. <laughs> and now we want to go into the English market. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so it's going to be absolutely easy, right? So you just translate your book and the cover basically stays the same. And you know, just hit the publish button because, you know, everything you know about the German market is true for the American market. Just use Would the same categories <laughs> and keywords and stuff. Is that true? <laughs> Can we just do that? Um, well, sort of and not really. Um, <laughs> so, so one thing I've worked, uh, I've worked with a bunch of publishing companies throughout the world. Um, and uh, I've worked with publishing companies out of Japan as well as in the UK. Um, I haven't worked with one in Germany specifically, but I've worked in Spain, uh, Brazil. And one thing I've learned is that there are all these tiny subtleties between the different markets and specifically with your book cover. Um, a great example of this is a buddy of mine. Uh, he published this book in America called Mini Habits. And it was, you know, a super bestseller. It was doing incredible. Um, and then somebody came out with Atomic Habits, which is kind of the same uh, book, sort of, and that kind of complicated. That being said, though, is that the author, Stephen Geis, uh, Geis of Mini Habits, was just crushing in the United States. And he got approached by a Japanese publishing company. And they said, hey, we know that you're not selling much, if anything, in the Japanese market. So what we'll do is if you just give us the rights to sell your book in Japan and we'll cut, you know, a 30 or 40 percent, you know, given to you. Well, in his mind, he was like, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I'm never making any money in Japan. <laughs> that sounds good. Now, from the Japanese perspective, this book was doing amazing in the United States. And it's really about, you know, uh, focusing on you and the little things you do and little things can make big changes, which according to the publishing company in Japan, that was great for their market and they knew it could be good. So he signs over the deal to them and immediately they get to work. They have their book cover designer make the book cover. And I remember him contacting me and be like, Dave, this book cover looks terrible. This is horrible. Why not just use my book cover? I'm like, and I was like, well, Stephen, here's the thing. They probably know what the market wants in Japan. And and his cover in America shows a drop of water just hitting the water surface and causing the ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And for him, that symbolized that one tiny change can make a ripple effect in your life. The Japanese, on the other hand, had a pure white cover and it just had words and that's it. And okay. he was like, this is like, are they taking this seriously? And I'm like, Steven, 
They know what they're doing. They're a legitimate <laughs> company. They know what the Japanese market wants. So he's like, all right, all right, I'm just gonna go with it. I might just let them do their thing. You weren't making any money in Japan anyways. You know, so do it. Sure enough, they launched it and he was the number one bestseller in all of nice. Japan for weeks. Wow. Clearly, wow. they knew the cover. And yes. for them, they knew that their market wanted, when they're thinking about mini habits and self-improvement and small changes for big, they wanted a clean, bare book cover. In America, that same book cover would tank. It would just yes. look so basic and unprofessional. And so he knew uh, from that point on that the markets can be, so the book is the same and they did translate it the same. However, the way you package it and present it was just a little bit different. And I've seen different levels of that between different markets. In England, you know, um, the UK market, it's not as much of a change between the UK and the US, but I have seen subtle differences. Also too, a fun case study, go ahead and look at um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's yeah. Stone. Yeah. Compared, and by the way, it's called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's yeah. Stone in America, not the but it's called Stone. Harry Potter mm -hmm. and the Philosopher's Stone in the UK. And only because they knew that the word philosopher had the Philosopher's Stone actually had meaning in the UK, but the Americans would not get it. And they're absolutely true. Exactly. Sorcerer's Stone <laughs> was more up our alley. So they actually changed Even the though subtitle. It's just from... Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, it's the wrong and... title, actually, yeah. So, but then on top of that, too, the cover's different as well. Yes. And and it's constantly different between them. Uh, the same thing goes with, like, a lot of New York Times bestselling books. You'll actually see subtle changes in the cover. Um, truth be told, there was a lot of time, I think it's just icing on the cake. It's just a little bit extra, you know, it's a little change that makes it better. Um, but we can also see, too, like on movie posters, um, a movie poster in America for the same movie is going to look completely different than the one in China or in Egypt or in England um, because they know that colors or, you know, um, the mark. Like, for example, Marvel, Marvel movies love to have the group of all the characters in one center. Yes. OK, you know, it's like a it's a thing now. It's a it's and in America. We're so used to it in the U.K., they do that as well, but it's a little bit different. There's more in the background. It's not yes. as strong centered. Um, and you can just see these changes. And I would say the same thing kind of goes with books. So while, mm -hmm. yes, I do think that a mass majority of books can just tran be translated directly, okay, um, the, the key is, is that how you present it, you might want to just take a little bit of an extra look. Um, I can't say specifically on the German market. Um, but that being said, though, is there might be a difference in the covers. And so take take a second, look at the competing books in the U.S. market, ask yourself if there's a common theme or thread on their book covers, and then look to redesign with that in mind. So would you say that is, so for book covers, this is kind of very obvious, you know, because it, it concerns the general packaging of the books. But is this also true, for instance, when it comes to like things like choosing keywords or choosing categories? Like, um, do you think there are also differences or different approaches that you have to take in each market? Well, absolutely, because, well, the approach you take to figure out the keywords is not going to be different, but the keywords are going to generally be very different. Um, mm -hmm. One of the one of the things that I love about Rocket is is that we so when we were designing the software, we could have taken the super easy route and just applied the same things from the U.S. market to all international markets. And uh, I know that a lot of other software or services out there do this, and, and it's hard to get the data on the entire market of a country. That's why we've been very slow to come out with every market out there. Now, the German market is a phenomenal market, which is also why it was my first one. Um, I see. There is Thankfully. Actually, there is a lot of connections. I had a lot of US authors do incredibly well in Germany without translation. And one of the mm -hmm. things I did not realize this, and I don't remember the statistics, but somebody told me this once and it blew my mind the amount of English readers in Germany is act is way higher than anybody would expect. It's really um, high. I even heard somebody say to the lines of that there were more English books being read in Germany than in England. Um, I didn't wow. see something, but it was <laughs> like, I didn't see the proof on that statement, 
But from the data that I see from Amazon, I'm not going to argue it because it was very clear the amount of U.S. books that are, or, you know, English speaking books are being read, digested. And so a lot of authors have focused on, hey, my book is doing well in Germany without even doing anything. Maybe I should try, you know. Um, and so I've seen it that way. That being said, though, is, is that when we were compiling the information, we found out that a word that does incredibly well in America, in the German market, even translated perfectly, doesn't do as well. And I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking, I'm not saying that, you know, in America, it's a bigger market, right? So I'm not saying, oh, it's only 5,000, you know, in America, and it's 2,000 in Germany. No, I'm saying it's almost like 5,000 in America and like nothing in Germany. Um, and so mm -hmm. that proportional relativity uh, mm -hmm. wasn't a one for one kind of situation. So we, so I would say that the keyword phrases in German can be completely different than that in uh, the U.S. market. Uh, people just have a different way of searching, is the way that I see it. And maybe it's because, yeah. and I'm speculating at this point, but the, the German shopper thinks in a different way than maybe the American shopper, you know, on how they describe things or how they want, um, you know, a, a good example of this with with a little bit of a joke in it. Um, you know, maybe the Americans like to describe a nonfiction book by the problem they have, but the German mm -hmm. people generally think on the solution they want. It's probably you know? the other way around, but I would have thought around. so too. <laughs> or maybe the other because way around. Right. Exactly. Germans I have... are very problem focused. The Americans are more, probably more like yeah. how to do this and that. And the Germans yeah. are, uh, I want why to be a superhero, you know, and the Germans are like, oh man, how do, how do I fight crime? You know? <laughs> It's, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's what, that's, that's kind of an example. I don't have data to back that specifically, but that's how it could really be different between two different countries and how the people per, uh, perceive what it is they want. Maybe a culture focuses on the, the solution and a different culture focuses on the problem. Um, in fiction, maybe, you know, one culture, um, views terms differently. Uh, than another. Mm. Like, for example, if I say the word prairie, that might not be something, you know, that, that really sticks with a certain country. However, though, if I say it's a prairie a romance, you know, everybody all know, you know, they're thinking of the, the, the prairie, they're thinking probably Western kind of component, probably 1800, 1700, you know, um, those kind of, like all of a sudden, all these things come into play. And so I could say prairie romance and leave it at that. But in Germany, if somebody is maybe looking for that kind of uh, romance fiction, they'll have to say Western Oregon Trail, you know, like mm -hmm. all these yeah. other things because there isn't that one term that is perceived. And yes. these are why the keywords can be very different between the countries um, or the marketplaces. And so that's why I really love what we've done with Publisher Rocket uh, working in the German market, working with the UK, is we had to really work hard to get that. Now, mm -hmm. we will be coming out with a lot more markets real soon. We've been working on some of them for years, and I think I have a couple of gray hairs from some of those markets. Um, <laughs> okay. But Canada, cool. <laughs> yeah, Canada, Spain, France uh, should be coming on, oh, and Australia should be coming on real soon. It would have been so easy just to say, oh, Australia, it's like America, you know, like. Yeah. You know, I would have thought. So, I would have actually. thought that. And it's yeah. not like it's very. There's a lot that are similar, but there are a lot of things where, like like I said, in fiction, they might actually have to explain things more, or yeah. in their fiction, they might not have to explain things more. But in the U.S., they do uh, to get to the same thing. There might be different connotations to certain words, um, you know, and so these all affect all that data. And that, so, yeah, so the keyword thing is going to be different. Now, with regards to categories, um, categories, there are absolutely different categories in every market. Okay. Now, there are a lot of the same categories in, in all the markets. But, for example, the U.S. market has over 11,000 categories. I believe the German market only has like four or 5,000, which means that yeah. it has half the categories that the U.S. has. So there are going to be a lot less opportunities out there to choose. Um, also, too, if you're going to publish your book into a different market, I suggest that you publish it as a separate book, okay? 
so not like a, an attachment to the original. Um, and that is, so you go into KDP and you launch it as its own book with its own uh, ASIN, ISBN number. Um, and the reason for that is that now Amazon does not allow you to select the categories for different markets for the same book. You have to choose who the primary is and then you can choose from that market. I see. So you say, for example, I wrote a book, uh, I put it in the US market. I will have to select the US as the primary market. And then after that, they're gonna give me all the US categories to choose from. And I can choose from those. But if I try to then go, and so say I publish it, if I try to then go and update it, I can't select the UK and then choose the markets and then the Indian and, and so forth. I'm stuck with what it is. And what they'll do is they'll protract that out to other markets, you know, like German and UK, et cetera. So if you guys go to launch in the US, you need to launch it as its own book and then select the US market and the categories there. Um, that's so far, that's the best strategy we're finding thanks to this new change in categories. So I, so I published a book in the US market, UK market and the Australian market separately. Good, yeah, perfect. Which, mean, which means, but, but that means that for reviews and stuff, um, I, I need to ask people, no, I, I need to get uh, gather the reviews for each market separately as well, right? Yeah, um, and generally Amazon likes to handle it that way. If I go to the French market, um, well, first off, um, we are not allowed to leave a review. Like even though I have a amazon.com account, I can't go to the French market and leave a review on mm -hmm. something because I don't have a French account and I haven't done three sales or three purchases in the French market to allow me to ah, leave a review. That's true, because you need 50, that, 50 euros. Or yeah, there's there's a mark, exactly. Um, because of that, Amazon doesn't like to show international market uh, international reviews on the book. They only want yours because it's not gonna help me if the person's writing in French, you know, and giving a review, <laughs> right? It's not gonna help me if the person's writing in German. Um, you know, because I, I won't be able to read it. And at the same time, too, maybe maybe the German market hates this book, but the U.S. market loves it for some reason, right? Um, and so they, they actually don't want to have the international reviews showing up on it. So just as a heads up, even in the old way, if you published in German, uh, the German market, and your book also somehow sold in the U.S. market, a review left in the U.S. market for that same book would not show up in the German market. I see. But But sometimes you have these, um, under reviews, you have these uh, reviews from other markets. I saw that. Now, they've started to add that, but they're also A-B testing. So one thing that I've noticed that Amazon likes to do is that they love to make money. And that makes sense, right? Um, they're always testing and changing things with regards to their, uh, to their website. Uh, one case study that I remember that I love was that they used to take the um they used to test for just the color of the buy button so a while ago they spent millions of dollars just finding the perfect color for the buy button now i know that's crazy right but if they can change the conversion rate by 0.02 percent we're talking tens of 20s millions hundreds of millions of dollars over the years right because that means that they are making that many more sales because of just the color so what Amazon likes to do is they like to change the way their website is laid out. And so, for example, I might go into Amazon and look at a specific book and see things a little bit differently than when, say, Freya goes on or when somebody else just down the street from me goes on and looks. And they do this thing where they're testing their site to see what makes more money. Now, what's really interesting about this is that they may prove that a certain person like me in a certain location usually buys more when the website looks one way. However, though, they may prove that when Freya goes on um, and she is looking to buy a book, the same exact book, that people like her uh, buy more when a, a page looks a certain way. And so what ends up happening is that the website of Amazon can look completely different at different times for different people in different places. And that's because Amazon's But, always finding ways to change their site to to sell more. But what does that mean for us authors? Because we have to 
you know, choose certain keywords, uh, choose how we uh, write the blurb, choose which pictures we put into the A plus content. Mm -hmm. I, I actually don't know how, how that is called in, in, in the English market. So yeah, A plus mark. So the good okay. news is, is that Amazon, so the keyword phrases isn't going to change much. Okay, that's always that's always solid and stable. Same thing with the book description, the covers, the A plus content, all of that is there. Where they start changing things is that the also bots. So the list of mm -hmm. books that are also bought when sometimes I those see. aren't there. Sometimes they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a color change. Maybe um, a long time ago, Amazon was changing the way they showed the data about a book. So, for example, sometimes you can go there and you will see this. It's almost like a carousel where it says yep. the number of pages, how long ago it was published, you know, who the yes. author is. Like it might be I a carousel like or it might be that one section where it's all laid out in a row. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. things are changing constantly. Now, that information is, is still the same. As well? Say is again? This, like for in, is this true for reviews as well? Because you always have like top reviews and those are the first reviews that are displayed. but. I have no idea why what makes a review a top review, for instance, yeah. because it's not necessarily the one that has the men, the most likes, for instance. Yes. So is this true there as well? Well, specifically with reviews, there's a couple of things that I answer. One, Amazon is still changing the way the review section looks from time to time. So that is true. Mm -hmm. However, though, uh, there are a lot of things that play into what makes Amazon choose to put certain reviews there. Um, I have data to back what I'm saying, but please take everything I'm about to say with a grain of salt because it's not concrete data. So some of this is my belief mixed in with based off of what I've seen in the data, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, my perspective is that Amazon works hard to try to show varying types of reviews, okay? Um, I think it's better for the shopper that if I, without clicking most reason or without clicking five star, or one star, or two star, or whatever, that it helps for me as a shopper just to be able to immediately see a five star, a one star, a three star, two star, like different types. Um, I see. I also think that Amazon's made their, and there's a special algorithm for this, by the way. They So it's not the same as the keyword algorithm. It's a different algorithm. But they have an algorithm that makes sure that they don't just show all the reviews that have the most upvotes because it's so mm -hmm. easy to game then right if us yeah, authors yeah. knew that okay if you like this review upvote it upvote it and get all your fans to upvote it now you can absolutely control uh, the reviews that people can see and so i think they change so it up interesting. i know i'm learning so much so these so there's a lot of things I, to it i think that yeah. they know they sell better when they show different types I know that they take into account certain reviews that have the upvotes, and all of that kind of compiles and creates what they think is the most optimal set of reviews to show in that case. That makes so much sense because I had, like with this one book of mine, I had a four star review that was, it didn't have many upvotes. It didn't, you know, it wasn't long, it wasn't special, but it was like the top review that was always yeah. shown for my book. And I was like, why is it showing this four yeah. star review? But now the after what you said that this totally makes sense yep and you know maybe too so, they're tracking yep. they're tracking the shopper and maybe they've seen that that review gets the most pause as in somebody's reading it or mm -hmm. engagement and now they might not have the most upvotes yeah. but it's the one that amazon knows is maybe worthy one last thing i'm going to put into in the reviews this is new news mm -hmm. um amazon just released that they're going to start using ai to read the reviews of all the reviews on your book and then compile a little blurb that says, here's the good stuff that's mm. been said. And then here's a blurb on the bad stuff that's been said. So oh, God. that's scary. Sorry, they did with the keywords. They just extracted from, from the reviews. Yep. And, and, now and so they, now instead of looking at the just, individual reviews, uh, you can get a quick feel for what's good about it based off of what people have said and what's bad about it based off of mm -hmm. what people have said. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah, really good it, because it? then you can see, yes, it is because, you know, there are always people who don't like your book and, and they don't like yeah. it for, for certain reasons. And when they see, yeah. well, these are the reasons people don't like about the book, then, well, they don't buy it. But sometimes you are like, well, that's actually something I like. So I, I buy the book anyway, because that's just not me, or that's some... not my taste. 
or yeah. some one star reviews they feel they don't feel organic because they are like just this one sentence that doesn't that could have applied to a thousand books you know and um those reviews of course you know they don't get as much traction then because they don't have any you know any substance to them yeah absolutely yeah. so and let's talk one more thing about categories. reviews too before no, no. we move on yeah no no that's totally fine okay <laughs> Okay, so one thing we learned about with reviews, too, <laughs> is that the five stars and the one stars get the least amount of attention. What we found was, from ah. some of our research, was that the two stars At least and the readers. three stars got the most attention of all. Right, because a wow. five star yeah, is yeah, just yeah, somebody who loves it, <laughs> and, and a one star is somebody who hates it. I want to read the review mm -hmm. from the person who acknowledges that there's good, but also there's bad. And so I, there's a lot of, that's yeah. why I think Amazon's going to be doing this AI system where now I can quickly see the good and the bad. And so in a way they're cutting mm -hmm. out the review to an extent and really mm -hmm. giving people what they want, which is a quick understanding of what's good about the book, what's bad about the book, and then they can make their decision. Yeah. I love that. But I think it's only true for readers that uh, one in five star reviews and acknowledge. I think uh, authors only acknowledge the five and uh, one star reviews. So <laughs> as, as a reader, I totally can relate to that because I, I like to read the two to four star re reviews. But as an author, mm -hmm. I try to only read the five stars and ignore the one stars. <laughs> Absolutely. I, um, no, it's hard. I actually have my EA read my reviews and mm. because I don't want to see the one stars and she'll mm -hmm. tell me if there's something that's actually useful from a one star because you're going to get the hater aids you're going to get that negabot that person that's like hey, he said this word and I don't like it like that's yeah. not going to help me but yeah, if the person exactly. said and, and if there's a constant theme of mm -hmm. you know hey it feels like he rushed at the end yeah. you know or um, in nonfiction, like somebody's like I there was this one chapter that's really confusing. Yeah. That's beneficial. That's constructive feedback. Yes. And so I love, but I don't want to have to read through no. the, the really painful stuff to get to the constructive. No. So I actually have her. That's so, so if you smart. have a spouse or a friend, have that person read through the one stars, dig out anything that's constructive to help. And then that way you as an author don't get hurt by reading the, the just the really mean things that people can say. Yeah. You know? I like yes, that. that. That's, that's a, good a really idea. good idea. That's really <laughs> worth the money you pay uh, these people. So um, I really consider this. So you pay your spouse? <laughs> no. And I have too many books to, you know, just <laughs> let it do something, uh, somebody uh, for free. So uh, maybe my readers could do it. I could ask my reader. They might do it actually. So, uh, but let's go uh, get into categories because um, this big been this big change. Uh, I think like three weeks ago when Amazon just um, yeah started to keep us from choosing like ten categories where we can put our books into. And um, mm -hmm. I'm still not really sure how I think about this. Um, and I really mm -hmm. like to pick your brain. I I really like to know what you think about it. Yeah. So there's some pros and cons mm -hmm. to it. Um, I believe that Amazon is trying, like Amazon has realized that a lot of books have put themselves in categories yeah. that they shouldn't be in. And, but I don't think that that's really been the motivation of Amazon because okay. every time I look at Amazon, I like to ask myself what makes them more money. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Amazon just didn't like, there were so many authors that knew about the whole category system where you can contact them and have them add you to categories that their personnel, their people, were having to work a lot to constantly update the data. So oh, I see. now, since there's no ability to talk to Amazon and have them manually do things, they either A, those people lost their jobs, which that'd be a bummer, you know, for them, or B, they were able to move them to something else and free up a whole bunch of work. Uh, I see. They probably saved a lot of money mm. just doing that one simple thing. Now, the other thing, is that um, they've now created it where you can select the three categories, okay? Now, Amazon says in their FAQ, and our data proves that this is true, is that Amazon will then look at the three categories you have, and first off, they say in there, we don't have to put you in the category that you asked for. Just because you selected it doesn't mean we have to do it. But they also say that we can also put you in more as well. 
And so what's happening is, is that Amazon is looking more at your, so you select three, and Amazon is looking at your book, and they're looking at your keywords, and then they're deciding based off of that if they're going to put you in those three, and if they, if, if your book really is those three, they might say, but all, we've seen books that represent this kind of book mm -hmm. do better mm -hmm. in these other categories. We'll put you in there as well. That's actually like in a real bookstore, right? When you... When they right. take your book, they, exactly. they decide which shelf they put you in. So it's exactly. And if they want to move you to the front of the store, you know, right there on that one table as you walk, as people walk in, that's their prerogative. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing is they're taking control of this and they're making sure that they get to choose where you go. And I think a lot of this was because of some really bad actors, not just the people that were lying, but also the big publishing companies were taking advantage mm -hmm. of this too. Um, mm -hmm. Harry Potter got in trouble a bit ago. Because they were, pub they had themselves in um, orphan oh. books. Okay, oh. so Harry Potter's <laughs> an orphan. But come on, Harry Potter. You don't need to be number one bestseller in orphan books. You know, that's ridiculous. And and so we saw these, these big time books just overtake categories yeah. and then maintain their bestseller yeah. status. Yes. You know, exactly. And, and Amazon was kind of like eye rolling, this is ridiculous. So I do think there's a lot of things. Now, one of the things that my, my team and I are doing at Publisher Rocket is that we now know for sure that there are certain keywords that will like help you to solidify yourself in a category and possibly okay. get you into more categories. So my team, my programming team, are right now studying and testing and finding all of those keywords that match with a category. And so one thing I look forward to releasing in the future, once we have enough data, is to be able to say, hey, if you're choosing this category, you really should select, you know, at least one of these, you know, four keywords. Mm. And by the way, here are other keywords you might want to think about because these are strong indicators of other components. And I think that's going to be a really awesome tool, another phenomenal benefit for authors because now you can really tie in your use of keywords yeah and categories, let them match together, yeah. help Amazon feel this truly is the kind of book we should show to these people. And yes. so I'm really excited about So this. that's what you're going to include into Publisher Rocket? Is that the plan? That's correct. Mm. But we're working on getting the good data mm. and making sure that what we have is solid. Mm. And so my programming team is working around the clock on preparing this because there's thousands of categories and there's yeah. Lots of keywords on each of those. And we don't want to put out the wrong information. Mm -hmm. So we have a bunch of systems to test and verify. But once that comes out, I think that's going to that's gonna be great. So I, while at first, right now, I'm a bit whole like, ugh, this category system is not as cool because they've taken some of the, the rights that we authors have. Yeah. That being said, though, is I think once we can provide that information on the keywords that are attached to categories, I think that really helps everyone. And then I think it's a really good system for everyone. Yeah. So, but even now, you would say, right, that putting in the right keywords and finding keywords, like really putting emphasis on this is something that is also very crucial now that Amazon has changed the system. Like oh, yeah. Publisher Rocket doesn't offer this yet, but still it's you, use the right keywords already because it might benefit your book. Well, you know, what it does is the process you use in Rocket to find the right keywords is probably even more important yeah. now than it has been in the past. Yeah. Because yeah. your keyword selection not only helps you in uh, being found on the Amazon store, it now helps you in your categories as well. And really, one thing I would change to people is don't stretch yourself on a keyword. So don't choose orphan for Harry Potter, okay? Yeah. Like, don't use that keyword. Sure, that might get you shown to more books, but that's also confusing the, 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 the Amazon algorithm, you know, and saying, wait a second, Orphans. This isn't a memoir. Wait a <laughs> yeah. second. This isn't a nonfiction. Or all the other orphan books are completely different from this. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So don't stretch out your keywords to something where it's like weird, you know. Or okay, come on. Um, so I think that's one important component, like one addition to your keyword search function. What I'm saying though is, is that once we have that out for the categories, that might give you a whole bunch of ideas that you never would have thought of that helped to really nail your book down in cool. that that section of the Amazon store that you really want to be in. Cool. So, um, 
you need all that, that <clears throat> data, right? And yesterday I talked. I talked to a German author who has really successfully translated into the English language. <laughs> and, um, nice. and and he said that there's so much more data in the English market than in the German market and that he's really annoyed True. for stuff like uh, even Facebook marketing, but Amazon marketing even more. Um, so how is your experience with that when you when you find the data for Publisher Rocket? There is a lot more data in the US market, it is true. But there's also a lot more data points. There's a lot more books, there's mm -hmm. a lot more shoppers. Um, and it's not knocking on the German market, it's just, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, we're able to learn a lot more and a lot faster. Uh, with regards to the German market though, um, it's still a very powerful market, it's a big market. Like I said, that was the second market I added to Rocket. If that says anything, from all the, yeah. the Amazon markets yeah. in the world, that was the second one I added. Um, it would have been easier to do the UK, but German was the one. Huh. So you guys are actually a powerful market, um, and it does have a lot of data. It's just not as much as the US. Mm. There's a lot of less here. <laughs> we have less so, stuff, but still. So, um, we're on the timeline here, right? So uh, you only have 10 minutes yeah. left. Um, so I was I was wondering, like maybe, you know, to, to, to close this, like what are your, if you if you were to give advice to us, <laughs> authors who want to go international, <laughs> like yeah. what are to authors who want to become the biggest in, thing? international best-selling authors, by the way, not only to get exactly. into the market, but so, to really succeed here, there. <laughs> so, so what are the, the three most important things to consider when trying to do an international launch. Well, let me ask you this, um, because the answer is going to be different depending on whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So which one would you okay. prefer me to answer? Fiction. Fiction. Okay. In fiction. Um, so first and foremost, I think a very important thing is just to make sure that the trope that, that you write in fits in that country as well. Mm. What I mean by that is, is that, um, so I used to be a Chinese specialist for the military. And um, the Chinese, like the story arc in the Chinese is completely different than in the US. And yeah. I'm, I'm gonna yeah, generalize on this a little bit, but it really helps. Generally speaking, and I think most Chinese people would agree with me, um, but I'm generally speaking, is that it's only a happy ending if everyone dies <laughs> or, just or that suffers yeah. mm -hmm. or suffers okay i remember one of my one of my uh diplomacy professors he actually married a chinese woman and he was saying that we were once watching this 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 movie and the the mother she has cancer she's dying her her son dies you know for his country her daughter is dying on the inside because her mother is dying and everybody's dying and all of a sudden she just dies and he's like oh my god that was terrible what i feel horrible and she's just sitting there she's like it was wonderful it was perfect <laughs> it was so sad and he's I like what it. yeah right that's tiktok so, actually so true my sister-in-law is chinese i can agree on that a hundred percent it's Chinese people are but like book talk people are like this well, as well. Well, and so, but here's the other thing too, though. Another way to look at it is let's even talk about humor, okay? Yeah. yeah. British, so America and England are pretty close, okay? I mean, pretty cl closer than than a lot, right? We, we we speak the same language. We used to be the same people, <laughs> not so much. Any. Here's the thing, though. I can laugh at British humor. I get it. My wife does not get it at all. She doesn't <laughs> find it funny. We can watch like Monty Python and she's just like, this is stupid. I'm like, this is, this is gold. Like, come on. Like, but there's other British humor where I'll sit there and be like, no, no, I don't get that. So uh, to answer your question on, on fiction, first off, just, just, just make sure that yeah, the trope that's so or the humor or those components actually fit in that market. Okay. How do you find because it if out? It doesn't. How, how do you find out? Oh man, that's really gonna, that, it really comes down to ben just spending Better time readers. with that mark now as an author if you're going to launch in the u.s this is going to be my second point which will probably help with the first point is that you know um it's start to kind of collect or you probably already have some american readers mm -hmm. on your email list maybe 
you probably have some American readers on maybe your Facebook group or whatever it is. If you're doing book, you know, TikTok or any of these, you probably already have somewhat of a collective. Yes. Um, it might be good to start a Facebook group or a Facebook page that's specifically centered in the U.S. Um, it might be good to start participating in the Facebook groups, the U.S. Facebook groups, um, you know, on your genre. So I love lit RPG, literature role playing games, um, and cultivation. I'm I follow a whole bunch of those Facebook groups, and I get to see them complain about certain types of books or certain tropes or certain issues, or you know, and that really helps me out. That's um, good idea. I might read some of the reviews that people leave and find out what it is they like mm -hmm. and don't like about some of the books I'd be competing with because they'll tell you especially in fiction, if that book doesn't follow the trope that they want, they're going to let you know it really hard. I know. Um, I know. <laughs> right, exactly. More, probably harder than one would want. These kind of well, give you a clue yeah. in on whether or not that is a good step. Um, and it can be, if you start gathering these readers on a Facebook group or a Facebook following or stuff like that, um, that could be a great telltale to figure out whether or not this is a good fit. Um, and if it is, then great. So to recap, we talked about uh, making sure that your trope, you know, or your humor or whatever is going to fit enough to be okay. All right. Uh, the second thing, though, is start really living in that market just a little bit. Start building up a little bit of a street team, if you will, a bit of a following. Um, maybe you already have some of them and just kind of bring them to that center. Uh, that will help you in figuring out the first part. And the third part is, like we were talking about earlier, is really focus on the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The cover can be... I mean, I've just seen so many little changes, but go study the book covers of some of the successful books that you'd be competing with, and most of the time you're gonna see a common theme. One of my favorite examples of this, and I'm not much of a paranormal romance, and I'm not much of a crime thriller person or anything like that, but what you'll notice is when you look at the book covers on certain, you'll always see if it's a female prota uh, protagonist in the cover, they'll look a certain way. Like, as in their yes. eyes will point a certain way. So, like, you know, and I'm making this up because I can't remember the specifics, but like in Dystopian, she may be looking off into the sunset, you know? Whereas if it's paranormal, you know, a crime thriller, she's looking directly at you in the book. In the thriller, and if she's it's, just and, running and, away. And, exactly. and that's the thing. Well, yeah, exactly. But you'll, you'll <laughs> notice something like where the eyes point. Or how yes. big the person is when they're at the center of the book. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're really forward. Maybe they're really far back. You're just going to notice some of these subtleties. Mm -hmm. And those are really important. And the reason why is that someone who just avidly reads paranormal romance, they're looking for covers that feel familiar. They're looking for because they've seen it. Just like we were talking about the more Marvel uh, movie posters. I could be walking by... Um, and I'll see it out of the corner of my eye and either know it's it's like it must be an action film. It must be a superhero, supernatural action film. Star Wars started adopting the same thing, um, yes. you know, and it's a feel and it grabs my attention because I like those. Same thing with book shoppers. That thing that they're looking for can be different between the German and the U.S. market. And so make sure that you have really studied that and that you incorporate it. So would you... One way to potentially get around that without having to study is finding a U.S. paranormal romance or whatever that genre is, cover designer and have okay. them redesign with that market in mind. So would you recommend to uh, use different covers for the U.K., the U.S. and Australia and the rest of the world who speaks English? <laughs> Nine <laughs> times out of ten, I would not recommend using a different cover for those three markets. Okay, okay the U.S., Australian, and U.K. I have nine times out of ten. There are certain genres or certain um, subject matters where I would argue you might want to change. However, mm -hmm. though, for other areas of the market, from what I've seen working in those markets that I've, I told you about earlier, um, the covers are usually different like very different and it really helps okay um, thank you so much oh, yeah. Was, yeah. now maybe yeah, maybe what you guys are writing in uh doesn't need a cover change maybe but i'm saying definitely take a second study your competitors look to see if there's really a differentiator mm -hmm. um <laughs> you know i've seen people do like the wrong color okay mm -hmm. 
like it was a you know a female cop uh, who was a detective and she was working in New York City, but the color in the background was like a hot pink, and so I thought this was like more of a upbeat you know crime mm. thriller if you will, and it was actually supposed to be a you know a scary thriller. Okay. And I'm like, well, that hot pink is not doing no, it. You know, but it wouldn't enjoy now, me either. That hot... <laughs> <laughs> well, see, no. So, like I said, even the color can create a different yeah. perception mm -hmm. as well. So just pay attention to that. And if you're seeing mm -hmm. that there are some things, then go ahead and bring a, you know, book cover, a U.S. book cover designer that specializes in your genre and see what they do. And I think that gives your book a lot better chance than if you're just taking the cover, more than likely, just from German and putting it in the U.S. Great. Great. Thank you so much. So we do have two questions in the end that we um, ask every person that's here and that's on, on the show. And the first one is, uh, which change to you do you wish to see in the book world? Which change? Mm -hmm. Huh. That's a great question. I would love to see. Um, well, I'm going to I'm going to put it this way. I wish Amazon would approve their Amazon ads. Ah, I, yeah. there's so many things there's so many things I wish they would do different and yes. quite frankly and by the way Amazon if you're listening to this um, you can hire me as them. a consultant and I will come in yes. and I will fix your system and I assure you haven't they asked you yet you will make more money and the authors will make more money I just it drives me nuts I just don't understand no. why they do what they do yes. there's a, so much like I said Amazon wants to make more money Amazon Fix it. You'll make more money. They just have to look at Facebook right. ads and they could learn so much. Yeah. Or even better, Google ads. Yeah. Because yes. Facebook ads yeah. has a lot more dynamics. Google ads is pretty much the same thing. Like just okay. Google's a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah. Just just recreate what they got going on there. Yeah. Maybe the ego's stopping them from asking or just <laughs> uh, using it. <laughs> so, and the second question, Freie, you want to ask it because I know it's your favorite. <laughs> so. I'm going to ask that because it's, uh, yeah, well, because the answer for me is always really, uh, it gives me a bad conscience to, to talk about this. But so what book is on your to be read file on the very top and why haven't you read it yet? Oh, to be read file. Um, <laughs> actually, so it's funny. I just started reading it. Oh. Um, and it is Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. um, wow. I, it's, it's been recommended to me a lot of times. Um, I have a lot of respect for this uh, professor, Thomas Sewell. Um, he, but it was like, it's like this thick. Oh my God. And it looks like a textbook. <laughs> but I, I'm already halfway through wow. it and it is, it just dispels economics. And now I'm actually watching some of the politics, you know, of people arguing and I'm like about economic policy and I'm like, oh yeah, no, that's not correct. <laughs> like, have you thought about, you know, and now I'm really enjoying it. Um, so yeah, cool. it's. I didn't read it. It's taken me long because it's that thick. Uh, but man, is it amazing and it's absolutely worth a read. Yeah. It's actually pretty interesting. Cool. Now, if you're looking for the fiction answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Now we're going to call my uh, sci-fi uh, card into question. Um, I haven't read Foundations by Isaac Asimov. And I feel like. I feel like my sci-fi card can call into question. I might have to turn it in after admitting that. Um, and <laughs> honestly, because Asimov is not one of those books where you can just roll through it and enjoy, Asimov is like, I don't know, putting your brain in a blender, blending it up, pouring it into a cup. You know, it's like, it, it's it's mind-blowing, and, it, and it's just hard read. Um, okay. So... That's probably it. So if you're into science fiction, um, you could check uh, check out the author I've mentioned before, who've transla who's translated uh, his books into English. He's been he's like the most successful science fiction author and self-publishing in, in Germany. And he's one of the top 100 self-published in the world. And in uh, his English um, pen name is Joshua T. Collard, I think it is. Okay. That's right. Excellent. Yeah. In German, it's Joshua Tree. In German, Tree, it's Joshua Tree, and but he, he, he said yeah. that um, Americans probably wouldn't get the joke. They would always think of the about of the <laughs> national park. So he changed it into Joshua T. Collard, I think it is. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> so Dave, yes. thank you so, so very much for coming Absolutely. to our show and talking to us. It was 
absolutely a blast. And I think, I, I feel like I had to write down something. And I was yes. really happy that everything yes. was recorded. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> really looking forward to, to editing this and, and go through it all over again. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, well, again, so. thank you guys for having me. It's been a real blast. Thank cool. you so much. Did you take some notes? You what did you take? What, what? Yeah, you better did. Uh, please copy those notes and comment below. I really <laughs> want to know what you got from it because I'm pretty sure we missed some stuff. So let us know what did you think of the interview? What is the main thing you have learned about keywords, categories, entering the international world in itself? And um, yeah, if you like this interview, please make sure give us a like, hit the subscribe button. And um, if you have any further questions, just go to straight to the comments. And a quick heads up, because Freya, she just changed her job. Kind yeah, of. I did. My, my day um, job, not the day author job. part. Not, not the author one. But that means that she'll have uh, a little less time for the next months. And that's why we have to step back a little from the interviews. We uh, have, there are two we have uh, uh, ahead of ourselves right now. And they're pretty amazing. Both. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. And, and I'll be doing some um, solo episodes. So stick if you with want us. them, just tell me, <laughs> tell us if you want them. And maybe I'll do some uh, interviews on my own, even though I'm really scared of this because Freya is just, she's just so amazing. You know, I, I, I just love doing this stuff with her because God, every time you make I- make me cry. I, Camera's on. Don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I, I, I don't find a word, she finds it. And, 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 and when I don't have a question, she has a question. So um, the, the interviews without her, may be a little more awkward well but <laughs> but the good news is this is temporary so yes. i'm gonna be back definitely and for sure and um so but make sure you stick with andrea there's amazing content coming up i promise you and um yeah i'm so looking forward if if i can come back like like <laughs> the way i want to yes so have a good time. Remember, you are allowed to be happy and you deserve to live your dreams. So go out there and take the first step or the, the thousand step to, to, to live your dreams and live your dreams now, not in the future. And if you've started already, just keep going and tell us how you're doing it. Bye. So, see you guys. <laughs>